Um, I'm Steve Schneider. This is the third, fourth, I can't remember, of our series of conversations <laughs> on design, right? No, on hypertextuality. And joining me is Jeremy. So say hello, Jeremy. Hello, everybody. Um, very good to be here again. Hello, Steve. Um, thanks for asking me. Yeah. And so, um, and you're seeing me, you can, hear, you can see me twice. I don't know if I really need that. <laughs> yeah. It's a little strange, but it's okay. It's like it's that got that um, that sort of weirdness, right? Which I don't mind. Um, there, James is back. Um, did Bush Bush's article on the Memex did that inspire you at all? As you were thinking about it, I don't think I was aware of it actually. Uh, I think I only became aware of it post Wiki, and it was um, first by people referring to it. So it's, um, in, in computing history, it's a bit like one of those albums that everybody claims to have, but they may not actually have listened to, or a book that people claim to have read. You know, it's, um, it's, um, it's, quite, it, it's quite common for people to talk as if they're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, recently, you recommended a book um, that I don't have to hand, A History of Hypertext. Um, which talks about the essay and talks about Bush and made me go off and read as much of it as I could. And I must say it's, um, what can I say? The, my retrospective uh, sort of feeling is it's very strongly expressed in the technology of its time. So it's all about microfiche and so on. And the technology of his time, I don't think was really sufficient to enable a strong vision of what he was trying to express. So now I think history is actually being quite generous to Bush, um, that I think um, to a certain extent what he's written ends up being, you know, I want a flying puppy. It's, it's a sort of a shopping list of, of imaginary features from a machine that can't be built yet. Um, and now we retrospectively see many things that we think were prescient in that description. Um, and um, without, um, without wishing to, you know, his achievement remains profound because he's given us a history and a starting point in history and so on. But um, I do wonder whether um, some of what's going on is that Bush was channeling, I think, very pervasive ideas that have popped into a lot of people's heads because what he was channeling was an attempt to, let's say, an attempt to augment the capabilities of the human brain by developing actually a fairly arbitrary model of how it feels like it works. So you know, there's no, um, there's no. Uh, we talked last week about how I think it's it's pretty um, pr uh, primal for many of us to visualise things as, as lumps and links between them, relationships. Um, and I can make that assertion, but I don't have. You know, there's no evidence to support it. It's just plucking, plucking an idea out of the sky. Um, but as I say, I think in this particular realm, um, what we're seeing is various people's attempts to draw a self-portrait looking in the mirror. And so necessarily a self-portrait drawn by Leonardo will you know, strongly resemble a self-portrait drawn by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, so I... I you know, that's to say, not to un Bush, I have now learned reading in the book, existed in this sort of awful 1930s world of having to gain funding for, in order to do any useful work, where um, it just seems like an, a kind of grim existence to me. At least if you or I have an idea, we can just experiment. We don't, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I guess you do have to go and get funding but I mean at least it, the building things part the testing our own ideas we have lots of ways of testing our ideas very directly the, I, I guess difficult the reason I keep coming back to it and I use it every time I I work this realm or teach this class um, partly it's to suggest that a lot of the ideas that we think started maybe with Tim Berners Lee, you know, who is the inventor or the initial author of HTML and often referred to as the, the father of the web or whatever, you know, um, really dates back to, to the 40s. And I think what was happening then that, that Bush captured 
uh, and captured it very imaginatively, I think, um, was the sense of lots of information flowing through. And one of the commentators in the Design Right um, Google group, Zachary, I think, is talking about information overflow and over, you know, and, and how do we manage this? And I think Bush was beginning to realize that in, in his field, remember he's coming out of the um, national government in the U.S. in the post-World World War, uh, World War II era, um, and trying to figure out how are we going to manage all this information? How are we going to um, share knowledge in a productive way? He began to see, I think like hypertext does, that we have to be able to make relationships across ideas, and we have to have some way of recording our travels through information. That's yeah. not, there's so much. So in just that, I think, and then understanding that he needs that, to me, I think that, I mean, I, I, there's lots of people who talk about all sorts of things in that article, but the thing that always sticks with me is he envisioned the reader as a writer, what I think of as a writer. He envisioned the reader as leaving footprints or, you know, his uh, a reader mark on various things and you want to be able to recover what you've done. Um, and so, interestingly enough, the browser history feature is sort of Bush's Memex. If you ever look at your browser history, yeah. that's everything you've ever seen I, I in a very I, elementary way. I think it's a very charming gesture to credit um, <laughs> Bush with the idea of trails. Um, but again, I think, um, you know, in academic study, when people are you know, taught how to learn, you're taught to make your own trails. You're taught how those trails can be used to reactivate your memories. So he's, you know, most of his expression of this timeless idea of trails is, after all, expressed in terms of you know, the technology of the day, as I say. Um, yes. So I, if for me, if I, this may not be quite when you're ready to say you, but if I was to choose a father of hypertext, it would indisputably be Ted Nelson. Well, then let's go did, to Ted Nelson. <laughs> well, because where I think, um, you know, Bush, if you like, came up with a shopping list of desirable properties for a machine to a brain. And as I say, some of those things seem to just be plucked from the air as, as, as ideas. Um, I think what Nelson gave us at his best was the um, tiny, crystallized, concrete ideas that you could explain to somebody on the back of a postcard and that we could label with a you know, brilliantly composed new wording that would um, ensure that everybody knew what we were talking about. So you know, we carved out an area with our vocabulary. We had this very simple idea of hyperlinks as being, for me, you know, the, the heart of of what he was talking about backed up by an admirably complete philosophical framework of um, why it's the right problem to solve, why it's the right answer, everything. Um, so uh, I think most of the fact that we still use the word hypertext is the clue that history has chosen Nelson's vision of hypertext as being the moment where these Ideas that were flying around in many brains, such as Bush's, suddenly became um, labelable, and in a very hypertexty way, it was partly by us giving it, or the community giving it a name, and uh, and to to an extraordinary thing about hypertext is that it's one of the longest lived branches of computer science. Um, there has been, you know, if you even look at programming languages over the last few decades the action has moved around um, within um, uh, different types of programming languages with different characteristics have been of interest to the community over the years. So we see us uh, and other topics like, um, uh, say, um, artificial intelligence that's been part of the landscape for a long time have certainly sort of upped and down in, in popularity. Um, but there's, um, for a field that's so speculative, you know, hypertext, doesn't solve problems in the same way that some branches of computer science image processing lets you detect defects on the factory floor. It immediately saves you money. Hypertext, like AI, has always been about promise. It's always been, it's, so it's, it's chiefly a, a vision that's expressed in terms of the human intellect and the, the implementation of that vision has changed through time, wikis being 
you know, one stopping off point um, uh, through it. So um, that would be my, um, my you, oh, you can't say eulogy until people are dead, but my eulogy to Nelson. And I would say to everybody, if you're interested in human history, um, Nelson is such an interesting man um, with such an interesting, I mean, a, a, um, I personally think a Mozart level brain, um, but with, um, by his own admission, great challenges in making himself understood. Um, that his story, his personal story, of uh, is really fascinating. Kind of depressing in a way, because now he's at the end of his career, he feels misunderstood, he feels, I think, cheated, and you know, he, there's a sense in which he, um, he is bitter. And I guess nobody wants to, wants to feel that that's what, um, that's what <laughs> awaits you know, them. You know, interesting, I mean, it, it, for, from an intellectual history perspective, and I'm going to keep talking while I get my power cable, because <laughs> my computer's about to die. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a video out there on YouTube, which, which I'll find and link to, um, that's actually Nelson's, speaking of eulogies, Nelson's eulogy of Doug Engelbart, who's the next person we're going to talk about, um, where he's, he's, he is, he, I think you're right, he's, he's, he's kind of bitter and, and, in fact, angry at the field for marginalizing Doug Engelbart. And um, that's better. And, and that the, his eulogy from that, from that funeral, which I'll, I'll share, you can find it on YouTube by searching for Engelbart eulogy Nelson, um, really does talk about how he was, he's so unhappy and he's essentially, he's really chastising the computer science community for casting Engelbart away. But I think you might be right that he's really, it's more about him yeah. as much as Engelbart. Um, um, and one of the, I'm going to drop Ted Nelson a line and see if we, see if we can get him to come on to our chat one of these days. One of the, I would just like to throw in actually that, um, uh, one of the fascinating things um, uh, about Ted is that he went on to invent other things beyond hypertext. Um, the thing that's always fascinated me is something he called zigzag, um, yes. and it's a data structure. Um, and it's um, he um, uh, describes it as a kind of um, master data structure. There's a special case of it as tables, a special case of it as trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a um, it's a, an, an all-purpose universal data structure, and his proposal is that um, we, it's a data structure that, that human brains can understand, that we can use it to build user interfaces, basically. And um, that's, the, that's the zigzag, right? Yeah. And, and is it, that related it, to this notion of zipper lists? Those are things I'm struggling it with. Is, it is, it is, exactly. Um, and um, I mean, for me personally, it's a really interesting idea, and... Um, in so far as I understand it, um, I've ex explored some of those ideas in my own work very explicitly, tried to make things I have done where, where it's appropriate resemble his um, zipper list. Uh, but um, it's also really interesting as a case study of how hard it is to explain something that is genuinely novel. Um, and so I, I guess what I'm getting at here is it's, when you look at the zigzag stuff and how incredibly difficult it is to grasp, it reminds us how hard hypertext must have been to grasp for people before they'd experienced it. You know, a point that we've raised before that we've mostly now, every human on the planet has clicked a hyperlink. We've experienced a version, albeit a watered down version of hypertext. Um, and when we think, thinking back to Ted first articulating and crystallizing these ideas, you know, there were the idea as Engelberg moving to Engelberg swiftly at that, at that time, the idea of sitting in front of a computer and using it interactively was regarded as, um, incredibly wasteful and not the, and self-evidently not the way that things should go which is extraordinary to us now when we think that you know, almost all of our interactions with computers are interactive. But then um, I th believe that both of them, but I think it was particularly Engelbert, had to, um, had to fight for this vision that people would sit in front of computers with this sort of feedback loop between them and the computer. And I think that's the theme that you see in many people's work when we're 
interested in augmenting the human intellect, you, there's always a sense of a feedback loop between the human brain and the machine, the machine changing to fit around the human brain, but also the brain of the user changing, changing in the sense of learning, So, but also changing in the sense of being in, yeah, in learning from the interactions with the machine. And so that, that, that comment nicely brings together the Engelbart, and I will, in this week's readings and viewings, will include um, a reference to what's referred to as the mother of all demos, and it's a series of videos um, of Doug Engelbart, who is a, um, at Stanford, or I can't remember, Stanford, I think, or Xerox Park, I can't remember exactly where he was at the time. Was a, but, I think he was at Stanford at that point. Yeah. And he gives what's called the mother of all demos in 1968 when he has 100 computer scientists in an auditorium and he talks on screen to someone else, which was revolutionary in itself, um, but then demonstrates these revolutionary ideas, as Jeremy just referred to, including the mouse and the file and the fact that you would put something in a file and then view it on a screen. and, and and his project was called, exactly using those words, Augmenting Human Intellect. And Engelbart and Nelson together, and I think they were, I've read in, in the um, book that you referenced on the um, called Memory Machines, they were not actually in touch at this time um, no. until a little bit later. They didn't know about each other's work, but like in many, I think, and, and like many, they, they were sort of working in the same direction in slightly different ways. Yeah. Um, they both imagine people interacting with and working with computers, not computers as something you put information in and got information out. You know, yeah. it wasn't a box that you put stuff in and got stuff out, but you worked with. And what we're doing in this class, which is not, remember, it's not, the class is not called hypertext, although we talk about it all the time. It's called designing and writing interactive texts. And we're really working on how do you imagine this text that you're, readers are going to engage with how do you as a writer imagine how to construct such a thing and that's I think where Nelson and um, Engelbart's work is worth looking at because they understood that they imagined that before anybody else I think yeah. was doing it um, the um, one of the books that the other one that I'm going to ask you to take a look at um, in the reading for this week is literary machines and um, and it was Nelson who wrote that book, Literary Machines, who was one of the first to say that, you know, it's, computers are not for computer scientists. They're human beings, mm -hmm. uh, sociologists and authors and fiction writers and artists, anyone should be able to use computers. And that was really Nelson's big push that they're called literary machines. They're for writing, they're for yeah. reading, they're for engaging with. Um, and this is all 1960s era thinking, um, not 70s, 60s, <laughs> late 60s, early 70s. And it doesn't really come to fruition for, for me <laughs> and for most people other than computer scientists until the sort of the mid 80s. You know, it takes a long time. And then really for the masses, the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and then really for the college university students, the early 2000s. You know, so it takes a long time for this to happen. Um, yeah. At this point, we're deep into it, and it's like, you know, so running a class and in, in talking about hypertext is sort of like having a class about oxygen. You know, it's just in the air. Everybody knows how to use it. So you have to force people to slow down, take a step back, and say, what is it exactly that we're doing? You know, so that, that's really the, the key here um, to, to figure, you know, to, to make visible all of these assumptions that are baked in, deeply baked in, just like breathing or picking up a telephone. You don't think about information theory when you talk to someone on the phone, but there's a lot of information theory, reducing uncertainty, the, you know, the, the um, oh, his name just flashed out of my mind, the, the information theorist whose name I wanted to Shannon. cite. Pardon? Shannon? Thank you. <laughs> Shannon, right? Who, who, Claude Shannon, who, 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 in a sense, his work, allows us to use telephones and, and, or to understand how that, that communication is going to work. And, and I would argue that Engelbart and Nelson is what makes it real for us. So um, 
If you were to think and to summarize, Jeremy, the, the lessons that we ought to draw um, for those who are writing, those who are constructing hypertext, not so much for the readers, but the writers, um, what do you think that, that, that they should know, that they need to know, that they need to understand coming out of, coming from Nelson, coming from Engelbart? Gosh, that's an interesting question, I suppose. It's something, maybe it's about unlearning. <laughs> um, and, you know, there is a, um, the way that I was taught, you know, my, my era at school was pencil and paper and sheets of A4. Mm -hmm. and so we were, for instance, um, sheets uh, of A4? Oh, that was what we called our, yes. the size of paper. And Eight and a half by 11 days. sheets for those on this side of yeah. the pond. <laughs> I mean, in fact, um, I was at the um, crossover with an even older format that was called Fool's Cap which is a sort of 17th century name for other wonderful. Anyway, um, <laughs> part of using paper like that was that you used the whole thing. Um, and so paper, the paper that we used um, imposed a size of writing. You wouldn't have taken 10 sheets of paper and written three lines on each one. So you wrote, it, the unit that you wrote in was essays, um, you know, roughly equivalent to a blog post today, mm -hmm. kids. Um, but a, a, a pretty chunky um, piece of text and um, uh, that way of thinking of the writing process as being beginning at the beginning of a um, you know, starting at the beginning of a sequence of text and spitting it all out whereas I think in hypertext we'd see that final text as just being a snapshot of one route through a body of hypertextual text hypertextual text i'm so sorry um that you that, that that emerges right at the end as a byproduct of what you assembled and what you assembled doesn't resemble big sheets of paper filled with paper it's this idea that we've talked about before where it's fragments it's fragments that you've decomposed in order to understand and uh generate decorate with metadata thread back together into a different sequence so that, um, uh, so we started let, me with stop right, let me stop you right there for just one second, because I think that is something really worth pondering a bit. And I think you, I think you've really hit on something that's that's kind of profound that I notice in the students, particularly undergraduates, not so much the students, but certainly freshmen when they're starting. And, and high school students, without a doubt, they start to write an essay and they're or they'd start to write something and the image is the page. Mm. Now students, for it's the image of the screen, that the Word document, the file in front of them, it's blank and they start to write and then they're constrained by the page and that's a linear process. Whereas in hypertext, you don't start with that image. Mm. Your brain starts with something else and I don't know what it is. It's a, well, that's why it's back to that spreadsheet in some respects, you know, that we were looking at earlier today you start with a um it, it's a it's a and maybe that explains why i um where do i have that i think i have that here um and i just want to bring it up on the screen for a second um and oh, nelson while, while you're finding it i'll just it's right there you start and is that on the screen yeah you start with that which is a radically different way of writing it's a it's a, like it, this is um you know we're we're, we're we're, we're comparing two things. It's a totally different, that's really interesting. One of the things that Nelson is also very passionate about, he, he's a very critical person and he, you know, he's, not, he's not afraid of um, being outspoken about things he doesn't agree with. One of the things he doesn't agree with is the way that most um, productivity applications for computers, particularly I guess the ones a, few, a year or two ago, were based around the user interface metaphor of fake paper. Mm -hmm. He explores at length why um, that's terrible, and mostly it's a sort of faster horses argument, the same you know, but, um, as we say about Ford. Um, but he's very hot on that stuff, and and uh, and and at his most sort of amusing um, because it's a slam dunk. He's obviously right, and there's barely anything to uh, to, to disagree with. Yeah, but that that initial point, that the confrontation, if you will. Um, or the, the way that the writer starts her work. Yes, and I think thinking, one of the things I've, I've learned is that this approach is less scary. 
that there's something there's something as terrifying about a blank sheet of paper as a microphone on a stage with a hundred and and yet, um, once you've kind of thought your way through it, um, hypertext, writing in a hypertext medium just says, write something down, write the next thing down, write the next thing down, make sense of it later. So you don't get that same, you know, the imperative is just to record the fragments that are flowing around in your brain. The act of doing that helps you to understand them. It also kind of clears your brain, leaves your brain free because now they're written down in front of you and you don't need to struggle to remember those things. So it's a... Well, it's kind of like brainstorming. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, interestingly, I believe that brainstorming is kind of wishful thinking. So I've been in big companies. Big companies are very apt to put people together and say, right, we're going to brainstorm. It'll be a prize for the best ideas. And, um, and of course, you discover that um, putting people together, you know, and, and, and giving them an incentive like that is not enough to, to, to generate ideas. <laughs> um, and so I do wonder if our conventional idea of brainstorming, which is that they sort of pop up like viruses do at school just from people being together, then what is a sort of um, a, a decent model of, how innovation and creativity happens. To me, that um, part of that answer has been serendipity. And again, hypertext offers um, some help here. That if I've um, if I've got all my stuff, all of these fragments of knowledge recorded in a hypertext system, the hypertext system can present that back to me in unexpected and unusual ways that might cause me to see serendipitous things. It might even apply artificial intelligence, neural networks, fuzzy logic to try and make its own connections or you know, provisional connections for, for me to review and understand. And that seems, you know, there's, there's even evidence from artists. Uh, I, I like the fact that Brian Eno, Luke Reinhardt, David Bowie and a few others um, explicitly use chopping things up and, you know, throwing them in the air as a as a, uh, a technique to drive um, the um, you know, creative process of creating music. And I've created a few tools along those lines myself, stuff that's um, little toys that are cut, cut what you do up and present it back to you. A bit like a good psychotherapist, you know. Yeah. They take the fragments and present them back. Yeah. Um, those, that approach to to writing that you just described where you don't start with the blank sheet, but you start with the generation of ideas. You, do you see that in Engelbart and, and Nelson's thinking? Or I'm not sure that? whether I do you see, because I think one of the things about both of them is that their position in history is that they were trying to, well, as I mentioned before, they were trying to persuade an, uh, a, a disbelieving world, um, a bunch of things that were incredibly hard to swallow. As I say, starting with the idea that interactive computing was a practical possibility. And so in a way, I think, you know, all the thinkers, um, they, um, uh, we suffer, we suffer now from, from um, actually them only being able to, you know, we don't see the most fully developed version of their thinking because um, they weren't able to put into practice um, everything that they were thinking of at the time, whereas now we have the benefit of these large-scale practical experiments like the World Wide Web. Um, so. So, so what we take from them is they kind of laid the groundwork, but they didn't have the... Well, I think... This was in convincing people that this is a good idea. For Nelson, say, you know, he envisaged the mechanism of hypertext and he envisaged what it, how it would work, why it would work, what would be compelling about it. But he, back then, um, didn't have the, what I think is called the normative experience of doing it. And so the things that have fallen out as the unexpected consequences of, of large, a large-scale hypertext medium, like the World Wide Web, um, you know, the things we didn't, I always cite um, email spam. You know, when we invented email, we had no anticipation that spam um, would turn out would turn out to be a problem. And um, computing's full of that, where we 
um, we go ahead and do things that we think we've been you know, envisaged quite clearly. Um, and then there turn out to be these unexpected, um, unexpected side effects. And some of those are really interesting because they end up being the you know, it's observations around that that end up driving the next wave. Um, <clears throat> so in the case of hypertext, I think now we must be in the second wave of practical hypertext systems. You could argue that um, editing HTML files, as Berners-Lee um, uh, proposed, um, was phase one, maybe phase two was wikis in our sort of very, um, very specific history of the field, because that changed writing hypertext from being a matter of understanding HTML to being a matter of understanding you know, far, far simpler markup. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, um, and to a certain extent, you could see the wiki, um, Cunningham's wiki as being a response to the fact that the World Wide Web never developed the features that Berners-Lee envisaged for people being able to run being a fix to that. Um, but as I say, certainly we, um, wikis benefited from, um, they emerged in an environment where that, that sort of hypertext was already, was already widespread. So I think we we rightly celebrate these three pioneers because they between them did an astonishing job of not articulating our field of hypertext or interactive text, but a number of related fields in mice and um, uh, display devices and so on. Um, but I think what, how we got to where we are today um, is the glorious result of the thing about hypertext, which is that because it's a reflection of ourselves, the hypertext dream is one that has lived in many people's brains. And we've seen generations of people being able to think about it, put their thoughts into practice. All those early systems we forget, like Windows had a hypertext help system yep. that just narrowly preceded the World Wide Web and was incredibly similar to it. And I'd, you know, I'd love to know how much of that Berners-Lee was familiar with when he did the web. Um, but... Um, um, so, you know, that's, that's software. Software is at its best. It is an accelerated cycle of experimentation, trying things out, criticism, responding, etc. cetera. Um, and we move fairly quickly now. Do you think that Nelson is able to, Nelson and Engelbart were able to move, move the ball further along than say Bush because of, the technical developments in computing, you know, Bush, because Bush, of course, never managed anything digital. He was all, he was about microfiche, <laughs> you know, I mean, wow. Emacs was, was physical. You could argue that all three of them, um, and I'm mindful of the fact that Ted is, is with us and could be watching this, but all three of them um, did not get the opportunity to um, to put into practice that which they envisaged. So Ted's um, been struggling to build Project Xanadu all his career, which um, uh, from what I have read, he sees as being um, one of the most important encapsulations of his ideas as a piece of software. Um, and Engelbert rightly is, is celebrated for the mother of all demos. But it was just that. It was a demo. It was a glimpse of what was possible. It wasn't um, Engelbart um, who um, drove the mouse into the mass market. That was Apple. You know? So, um, in fact, I guess, if we, so if we plot a line of all these pioneers and they were building on each other's shoulders knowingly and unknowingly, there's a sudden explosion in 1990. Um, and that was the explosion of the personal computer, I guess. And, and certainly I'm, I'm appalled by reading the, the, this book that we must give a proper citation to in the wiki because I'm failing to even come up with the title. Um, um, I'm appalled by how the much... The memory machines. The memory, memory machines. Memory machines. So it turns out that an awful lot of the history of hypertext is the history of small-minded backbiting in academia. Um, yes. The, the terrible things that people have to do to get funding. And um, thank goodness, something so important to um, the human condition um, has wrestled itself 
free of uh, well not free of academia but you know it's now to one of our recurring themes is now breaking out of academia and become um a ubiquitous universal idea you know mm -hmm. um because through the spread of the physical implementation that we have i think what i said about hypertext being you know a common mental metaphor i think that must be even more true now than it's ever been before because everybody almost everybody has had the experience of hypertext yeah so the the um what, what we're going to talk about next week in our next conversation is sort of what happens after bush and after engelbart and nelson particularly um mostly in the early 90s which is the i'll i'll, I'll term the, the golden age of hypertext research okay so for the first time it breaks free of of Nelson and, and Bush and lots of people like me, um, you know, young scholars, I was young at the time, you know, in the early 90s, grabbing onto this thing called the internet, the web, we didn't know what it was, but we knew it was big. And we knew that it changed the way we thought, to change the way we write, change the way we read. And so there's, there's, um, you look at, the, there's just dozens, hundreds of articles and essays written about hypertext in those early days, um, which at this point is sort of, charming but i find highly instructive to go back and one of the things that we've done in this class um and i think it's in the notes and quotes exercise or created the opportunity for people to to take that hypertext our hypermedia handbook from the 19 early 1990s and and read it and play with it engage with it um but you see a lot of themes that i think jeremy is, is referencing people you know when those ideas were fresh when the engelbart and bush ideas Engelbart Bush and Nelson ideas were fresh in our minds. What did scholars do with those ideas? How do we imagine people using it? And now, um, 30 years later, how right were we? How wrong were we? So that's what we're going to kind of cover next week when it was the, the golden age. And then what happens after that is that the, after that five to 10 year period of intense activity through the 90s, it stops. <laughs> You know, and the research stops at some level. It doesn't stop all completely, but um, so I don't mean to slight those who have, who were still actively engaged in the 2000s in this, with these topics, but the, the number of articles with hypertext in the title published in scholarly journals plummets. Um, and, you know, the, 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 so, the, so I'm trying to understand what happens, but we'll, we'll focus on what we thought was happening in that period of the 90s next week. Um, and we'll, we'll keep our focus today just on, what was what what the ideas were that we were bringing to it um could you go back and chat a little bit about the the zigzag and the zipper list i realize it's a little far afield but i see when i do that and i struggle with those ideas it reminds me of trying to read um some of the philosophy work like in jürgen habermas i would spend a year reading this a few pages just to try to really understand it and so i don't Quite, but I read the Nelson stuff on zip, zipper lists and zigzag, and I say I know this matters to me, but I don't, I can't quite figure out how. C could you? Maybe this isn't possible. Could you talk a little bit about how some of those ideas are reflected in the Tiddly Wiki that we're using today, or is that just too not possible? No, it's um, it is uh, it, what. So what Nelson's proposed in zigzag is a very specific and concrete proposal and it's about um traversing from cell to cell and so he's imagining cells to have relationships to one another that allow us to create and that there's in in this the simple instantiations that he explains there's two directions um, and you can kind of see how a spreadsheet is a collection of cells with a little bit of rules about how you can navigate from one to the other. The thing that's extraordinary about his rules is that they're counterintuitive. Going forwards and then back doesn't necessarily take you back to where you started from. So at a, um, it's a rather surprising thing. There's at a fundamental level, it feels that the metaphor so that you know with the, the metaphor of a spreadsheet is a grid of cells the metaphor of tiddlywiki is index cards titles links etc the metaphor for zigzag is confoundingly complex you know all those other metaphors they take as their starting point something pretty concrete familiar to people 
And the only jump is a you know this fairly safe jump about people being able to understand links, for instance. Um, whereas zigzag is not like that at all. Mind-bendingly complicated, and therefore the things that um, uh, Nelson says about it become credible. So uh, on on his website, he t he talks in very characteristic language. We have discovered a new simplification based on one simple concept, a new liberated form of data that shows itself in wild new ways. Conventional data structures, especially tables and arrays, are confined structures created from rigid top-down specification that enforces regularity and rectangularity. But our structure is created from individual relations bottom-up. It can be irregular and unlimited. So that description you start to see there's bits of tiddlywicky and i'm not sorry not tiddlywicky of wikis in that and there's something philosophically that's responding to raggedness and so again word processes assume you're just going to emit this novel word by word wikis assume it's going to be a messy process that you're going to need to make sense of to produce that text um and nelson i think is is he's offering us a data structure that could be as ubiquitous as tables you know rectangular grids are still almost universal and even systems like tiddlywiki use them as a metaphor all the time so to me he's saying understand this one unbelievably complicated thing and potentially we enter a new world where because i think that grid-like thinking is incredibly constraining I'm sure I may have said this before, but I, as a human being, which I am, I enormously enjoy the privilege of being a human being to be irrational. The fact that my brain can hold two conflicting points of view at the same time or two contradictory opinions, that's actually really liberating and wonderful, I think, that I'm, I'm not constrained to be a, you know, a rational, internally consistent being intellectually. I'm allowed to have ragged edges. So I think that about my brain, if you see what I mean, again, this introspection. And I see that recognized, reflected in TiddlyWiki and other wikis because they're forgiving of that kind of um, uh, floppiness. Um, and in ZigZag, the same thing. Uh, this, uh, and I, I find it immensely appealing, the idea that that kind of anti-intuitiveness uh, anti of the real world might need to be reflected in the tools that we use, zigzag being, you know, if it worked, um, a very attractive tool for us all to use. So, so uh, let me let me try this out and see if, because as you were describing it, and maybe maybe I have internalized it more than I knew. Um, the next assignment or the next exercise that we're going to offer, and it's it's been in development for a little while. I've been waiting for folks to catch up, but I'll roll it out soon. And um, is this idea of Encouraging um, our writers in this in this um, class or this community—that's the word I'm looking for—the participants, the writers in the community to to um, take their phones and take pictures, take photographs, and then put those photographs into a tiddly wiki and caption the photographs with a series of three or four or five um, what I'm calling wiki words, things written in camel case. Um, we import those those objects which currently are being stored in in um in flickr because that's you know and we import them and then by clicking on those wiki words it creates a navigational structure amongst those objects which didn't have a structure before mm. and that structure is not rectangular you know so I, i'm working with um, one of mm. our participants is, is training a dog and, and doing a big dog study um and so she takes pictures of the dog doing this and the every day comes up with new vocabulary. That was one of the, the, the ideas that you gave us a couple weeks ago about, and we've implemented it there of using wiki words as vocabulary building. And they're not, it's not rectangular. It's not grid. It's not like the spreadsheet that we, sh I put on the screen a few minutes ago, but it's sort of much more open-ended. Is that zigzag thinking or I'm still not there? I think, um, I'm not there. Okay. <laughs> I think it could be. I mean, look, the, is zigzag thinking, Nelson addresses this, the website, um, he says, you may think of hyperthogonal structure. So he says, 
that zigzag gives an example of a hyperthogonal structure. Sculptures of cells in three dimensions or more, crossed lists in multiple dimensions, irregular constructions of cells at right angles and side by side, or crystals of lists in corresponding connection. So I think with those four examples, he's actually giving us permission to take a fairly wide... I will build a tiddler around yeah. these ideas with links so that you, you can find them. But I think, okay, so if, if we could come up with, with ways for our writers in this community to explore zigzag thinking in tiddlywiki, that would be interesting, right? Yes. It would. Um, the, exactly. I, uh, and and I, in, in that case, I perhaps, um, if, we're gonna, if that's going to be an exercise between this week and next week, perhaps what you should ask me next week is a question that you articulated earlier and I didn't answer, which was what features of Tiddlywiki were influenced by Zig Zig? And there is one, so it'd be interesting to see if that's spotable. And um, you're not going to tell us which one it is? I, I don't mind, it can be. Um, it's the way that the tags work. So I see, um, uh, I use, in Tiliwiki Classic, tags are not ordered. So that means that a, ta a tag defines a subset of a collection of items. In Tiliwiki 5, a tag also defines the ordering of those items. So you know, imagine on one side the diagram is a number of potatoes, some of which have a red dot on this one number of potatoes and they're threaded together by a needle of thread that has gone through the flesh of the potato. That well-known threading potatoes metaphor. Um, and um, what's interesting about those threads is that each potato can have multiple threads going through it um, and co so therefore can exist in multiple stories, trails, sequences, whatever you want to call them. Um, and what uh, what you'll see of um, uh, 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 there was a useful thing in that list. He said crossed lists in multiple dimensions. So um, zigzag feels like a formalized kind of model railway system for a, a system for making those tracks um, that join. Well, railway tracks don't join things together. But imagine, imagine if we could combine those two concepts. Um, that gets you close to the building blocks out of which zigzag is built. But to say, my personal experience is I, I don't feel that I even remotely fully understand the zigzag. I think it's, um, you know, it's like one of those um, games that um, uh, you know, chess was like, a, a lifetime to master, I think. Um, and that makes it fun and interesting. So, so this conversation has been fascinating for me um, and, and, and I hope for others. Um, and, but what it's done is solidified my emergent view that the key factors of hypertext are not the list that I started the class with of linking, sorting, filtering, tagging, transclusions, but in fact really come to three major things that are distinct. Linking is its own thing, and filtering and sorting is part of a link. Tagging is something altogether different. You, it, it just requires a different thinking. And then to me, transclusion still stands separately. That transclusion is not tagging, transclusion is not linking, so therefore, there, there are three, and those, I think if I'd have tagging, linking, and transclusion, or tagging, linking, and transcluding, I may have, I might be able to write a formula that says hypertext equals linking plus tagging plus transclusion. And I may yeah. have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think linking, tagging, and transclusion, they're the first, I think they'd be the first three in my list, or is the first three out of the first four or something. Um, and the beauty of a list like that is that you can stop anywhere. So, you know, we can stop at hypertext as links, and hopefully that still makes sense. And, and so choosing three, that's not a bad cutoff point, because, you know, the list that we've been collaborating on is at seven items or something. That, you know, that, that, that number of items is exhausting, that kappa yes. and so on. But three is maybe the magic number. And so, yeah, I applaud the quest. To is there anything... The, yeah, do you think there's anything that Nelson talks about, particularly Nelson, not so much Engelbart, but particularly Nelson, that is not 
collected or referenced somehow in linking, tagging, or Oh, I think there's a lot, actually. Um, and part of the reason is because don't forget that what we're talking about here is still characteristics of the software. So if we were to do it, we could do a similar exercise for those, the sort of the mental capabilities that hypertext underpins. You know, there's some part of hypertext that exists in people's brains, and we could apply the same process breaking down to that. And I'm not sure you'd come up with the same ingredients because this functional decomposition into linking, transclusion, and tagging, sorry, linking, tagging, and transclusion, you know, is very implementation-based. To my knowledge, I don't think Nelson really talks about tagging in the same way that we do, that, um, uh, that I'm sure you know, his, his thinking would encompass the idea of flexible metadata on items of text in order to describe them, of course, and in a sense, that's what tags are. But this very specific idea of tags that we've got post Flickr and so on, which is the sort of tags as a social media construct, and then in Tiddlywicky's case, this even more special thing of the taggy tagging thing of tags actually being tiddlers themselves. I think that, that you know, that's, that's post Nelson, if you like, this elevation of tags. Um, but you'll also note that it was the tag implementation that I pointed to as having elements that were informed by my readings about zigzag so you know maybe it'll all join up again uh, so zippered yeah. lists are basically lists of tags potentially I, that's the way that i'm going yes yeah. okay. I, was, I believe that one could um build a different user interface on top of tiddlywiki that looked like zigzag and that used tiddlywiki's tags as its implementation medium Okay. Well, thank you. Possibility. Yeah, that was that was wonderful conversation for me. I hope it works for everyone. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll let's leave it there, and we'll carry on next week. Indeed. Thank you very much, everybody. I shall thank look you. forward to it very much. I'll drop off and let you deal with the recording and everything.